Good afternoon. This is Victoria Buell with the Ohio LTAP Center, and we are very pleased to have a webinar for you this afternoon on local road safety plans. Um, the presenter is Jerry Rochi with the Federal Highway Administration. Jerry has worked in the, the safety area with Federal Highway for a number of years and has been recently working directly with Ohio on a, a pilot process for local road safety plans. And that is why we've invited him and he graciously agreed to do a webinar for us today to give everyone a, an introduction to what a, a local road safety plan or LRSP is. So. Before I turn things over to Jerry, just as a quick reminder, during the webinar, we are going to attempt to record the presentation. If we're successful, then we'll send the link out to everyone. If we're not, it's a good thing you're here, because then at least you'll get the information. Um, also, there is a chat pod on the lower left-hand side of your screen. Please go ahead and put your questions in there during the presentation. I will make certain to read those off to Jerry. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will also unmute the audio lines, phone lines, so you can ask questions directly. Um, but during the presentation, we are going to keep them muted to cut down on background noise. So without further ado, Jerry, are you ready to jump right in? Yes, I am, Victoria. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Excellent. We'll go ahead and get started today. Um, it's a pleasure to be joining you guys. Um, uh, certainly uh, have uh, been very impressed with all of the great work that Ohio DOT and, and Ohio in general has done. Um, so it's it's a pleasure to uh, do something for you guys. As a FHWA person, there's a lot of times where we're using Ohio as an example, and so I'm uh, glad and, and fortunate that there's a time where we can maybe share some things with you guys. So um, it's uh, very good to be here. So. Um, just a little bit of information about myself. I am in the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Safety. Uh, I work in our headquarters office, uh, mostly in the areas of safety analysis uh, these days. So uh, I've been le leading an EDC4 initiative, or Everyday Counts initiative, it's called Data Driven Safety Analysis, and Local Road Safety Plans uh, fits firmly in that uh, in that area. So uh, I've been with Federal Highway Administration uh, just over 17 years now. So uh, I've been in the division office. I've also been in the resource center, and, and now with headquarters. So. Uh, like I said, it's it's great to have a chance to help out uh, Ohio a little bit. So um, my first job, actually, when I was uh, in in uh, college, was uh, was an intern in a county uh, engineer's office, and so I have a great uh, deal of respect and uh, for for your folks and admiration just on all the different things that you deal with on a on day to day basis. Like I can't think of a job that's probably more different from uh, you know probably hour to hour, uh, let alone day to day. So. Um, thanks for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us. So, I uh, wanted to mention uh, that a lot of this uh, material that I present is from an effort that we've been doing with NACE. Uh, FHWA was asked by NACE to help out with uh, what they call a do-it-yourself local road safety plan pilot. So, there's a number of states that have been working on local road safety pilot uh, plans, and so this was an effort to, to try and accelerate that a bit, reach out to some states that uh, have been interested but haven't yet uh, kind of uh, taking that on, and so uh, Ohio was one of those states that uh, that we targeted. We had um, 25 counties in six states, so it was uh, uh, qu quite a large group. Um, and we had uh, uh, five counties from Ohio that participated: Champaign, Delaware, Franklin, and Holmes uh, participated um, throughout that process. And then Warren County uh, joined us for our in-person workshop. So that effort was really done over about uh, four months' time. Uh, we started in January. Uh, with our first uh, webinar, we did three webinars, uh, I guess say four webinars, um, and we also had an in-person workshop that was done in conjunction with the NACE annual meeting. So that worked out great in Wisconsin there in April, uh, where we had a chance to, to sit face-to-face -face and help with uh, the local road safety plans. So uh, those plans are being completed as we speak. Uh, we finished the last webinar just about a month ago in May, uh, and those plans have been trickling in as agencies are, are, are putting the finishing touches on them. So, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, and, and, and certainly I invite any of the folks uh, from Ohio that participated in that to uh, to chime in or share your experience as well. We're looking to do a second round of those pilots uh, uh, coming up here in the next few months, uh, and so uh, love any feedback that you guys might have uh, for us uh, going forward. So um, today we're going to talk about local road safety plans. Uh, I'll give an overview of, the, of what they are. Um, 
and, and probably more than just what, I'll talk about why they exist and what they can do for us. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about strategic highway safety plans, the state plans, uh, and how these build off of that. Uh, then we'll get into the nitty gritty. We'll talk about developing a local road safety plan and all the details with that. Uh, we'll talk about how Washington State has, has uh, approached this effort uh, statewide. Uh, and then really spend some time going through a, a case study from Thurston County, Washington. Thurston County is one of our um, uh, participants and, um, I guess, leaders uh, uh, as far as the NACE effort. And so it's been great to share their experience. And I wanted to share some of that with you as well. Uh, and then we'll finish off just talking about some examples and resources that are out there. So, um, and, and you feel free to jump in if you have questions. We'll certainly have time for those too. So. Um, get into this. Uh, what is a local road safety plan? Uh, there's a lot of different definitions, and states are sort of defining these on their own. That's certainly great. Um, the first one's kind of uh, real general. It talks about a you know document that identifies safety issues impacting local roads, uh, and and provides a framework to accomplish safety enhancements at the local level to reduce severe crashes. I that's probably my favorite uh, explanation of what these are. Um, I also like the one below it that it's a little more um, detailed. It talks about a data-driven risk-based process to identify, analyze, and prioritize safety issues and target uh, countermeasures and, and strategies to address these severe crashes on local roads. So I like that one, too, as a, as a data guy. I think that really is important to talk about the data-driven and risk-based uh, approach. And we're going to spend some time uh, really kind of getting into what that means as we go along here today. So. Um, why local road safety plans? I think more than important than what is the why. Um, we certainly know your agencies, uh, you know, own the, the the vast majority of roadways that are out there. Uh, these roads began as wagon trails or paths, or um, you know, there were there were first things that were across our great nation, and so we realized that those this varying design standards, if standards at all, for some of these roads. And so, uh, but the reality is that's where uh, I'll say 40 to 60 percent of our fatalities occur, and so. Um, just that number there where it's a range, you know, we, we don't actually even know how many local uh, uh, fatalities happen on the local system. It gets a little bit convoluted uh, trying to report that on a national basis, uh, making sure that we have all the fatalities recorded. Uh, it gets a little wonky when you get out to the east, uh, s southeast with uh, states like Virginia and South Carolina, where technically those roads belong to the, s the state DOTs, uh, but they really are local roads. And so we're, uh, that's an effort that NACE is, is helping us with, uh, and we're working with them and the National Safety Council on to get a better answer for that. But uh, it's certainly around 50%. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about how local roads uh, safety plans can be a proven safety countermeasure too. So um, I was going to show you a video. This uh, this video here comes from Clackamas County, Oregon. I don't think our audio is going to work, so I'll uh, I'll just uh, skip over this today. Um, as you see, we we prepared for that, but we have all the links in, in the in the presentation slides so that you can watch it on your own. Uh, but I thought this video was well done. When we start talking about fatalities and you know over 15,000 of those happening on the local system, it's really easy to kind of accept those, and we kind of accept it as as part of the you know the cost we have for for being mobile and. and uh, in the grand scale of things, it's hard to, to really visualize how we could reduce that uh, in a meaningful way across the country. But when you start to zero that in, you start talking about what happens on our county system. And in Clackamas County, over 40 uh, uh, fatalities happen each year. Um, you know, folks find that unacceptable. I think we can do more than that. Uh, but when you really zero it in, you start talking, you know, how many fatalities are acceptable in your own family? Well, the answer is obviously zero. And so when you start looking at it from that perspective, it, it really helps you hone in that, you know, we can do more of this. Uh, um, you fo folks have probably heard of a Toward Zero Deaths or Vision Zero Cities. Uh, that, that's really taken an approach that, that began in Sweden when they look at it from a safe systems approach. And, and so you know, looking at all the things that happen, there's certainly driver errors and behavior things that are, that are happening, uh, but there's ways we can improve that so that, that their poor choices don't mean uh, you know, loss of life. And so we can do more than that. So um, we'll kind of continue on here. Um, why, would you, why would you consider uh, developing a local road safety plan? Well, they can really help you define your safety priorities. And so you can look at the areas that are, are, are your issues. You know, is it roadway departure? Is it intersections? Is it pedestrians? And, and start zoning, you know, um, focusing on those areas. It can help you prioritize your safety investments. And so rather than just do something each year and, and kind of helter skelter, it really helps you prioritize those investments. And what's going to make the best difference here? And, and what's the most data driven uh, approach we can use for this? So. Uh, it helps to serve as a communication tool as well. And so I know Ohio is a little bit unique in that all of the county engineers are elected officials. And that's uh, that's fairly unique around the country. I'm not sure of any other state that, that does that. So you certainly understand the importance of communication. But 
Uh, these, these plans can really help as a communication tool for you to reach out to your constituents and, and, and customers, um, even in states where the, uh, you know, the engineering position isn't elected, but uh, you know, they report to an elected board. It can help them work with their board of supervisors and, and know, what, um, you know what the safety concerns are, where you're focus, focusing your safety efforts on, and, and so that you're not just chasing uh, what is perceived to be a safety concern. So, uh, it helps you develop lasting partnerships, you know, working with other agencies, uh, whether that be the state DOT or the LTAP office, uh, but folks in, in law enforcement, in schools, and in, uh, in emergency response. There's a lot of partnerships there that you can help, um, you know, share this burden. Uh, it, it certainly takes a, a lot of folks. I always think about team. Uh, together, everyone achieves more, right? So we'll talk more about that as we go into the details of, of developing a plan. But uh, it also helps position you to uh, to apply for outside funding or, or, or grants. Uh, Ohio DOT is great at sharing their safety funds. Uh, that's not always the case around the country, so um, you, you're very fortunate to be in Ohio. Uh, it helps create a sustainable safety effort, like I mentioned. You know, you don't want to just do one thing this year and then next year you shift gears. This can be a multi-year plan that really helps you kind of, you know, figure out uh, what we're going to do first, what are we going to do next, what are we going to do, you know, further out, maybe two years out, maybe e even further out than that. So, uh, and ultimately the, the goal is to reduce those severe crashes occurring in their own communities. Uh, uh, these are folks that you know, uh, particularly that the more you get to the local level, you probably know who these people are that are, are impacted by these crashes. So. Um, I, I think that again is the is the probably the biggest why, right? So um, we'll go ahead and touch on strategic highway safety plans. Hopefully, you guys have heard of the SHSPs uh, in the past, um, and I would I would guess in Ohio that several of you were involved in the process to develop a, your strategic highway safety plan for Ohio. So uh, SHSP is a statewide coordinated plan that provides a framework for reducing fatalities and serious injuries on all public roads. So we certainly want the local agencies or local roads to be included in that. Uh, it helps identify the state's key safety needs, you know, where they should focus their efforts, and it really guides their investment decisions towards strategies and countermeasures uh, with the most potential to save lives and prevent injuries. And so uh, we want those to be data-driven and, and really helps kind of set the stage for how they spend their funds. And so uh, this is a little bit bureaucratic in, in how we present it, but the, the SHSP is sort of the umbrella document uh, that, that kind of goes over the whole process. Uh, these are required to be updated every five years. Um, they include infrastructure and behavioral countermeasures. Uh, the process goes through and is approved by the division office and Federal Highway Administration, uh, and it is a requirement for, uh, for each state's uh, highway safety improvement program. So you see the two main funding categories there, the HSIP on the left. Uh, that's the funds you're probably most familiar with. That's where the infrastructure funds come from for safety uh, at the federal level that, that flows through the state DOT and then hopefully down to the local level, level uh, as appropriate. Uh, and then on the right, we have the Highway Safety Plan. That, that is the, the, the plan that uh, is, is dictated by NHTSA uh, that works on the behavioral issues, mostly for law enforcement type improvements and whatnot. So um, those work together um, to help develop the local road safety plan. Uh, this is just a, a localized version of the SHSP. Um, sometimes it, it flows directly from the state plan and it's the same areas. Uh, in some, some situations it's different. The, the safety needs on the local system might be different than the state system. So, um, but that's kind of how that works. Uh, in Ohio, you guys did a great job in your last update uh, back in 2013 or so um, of including local roads specifically. You talked about moving forward. Ohio will be placing greater emphasis on providing funding and resources to local governments, which are responsible for improving safety on the majority of Ohio's roads. So um, they even did, uh, included the analysis, and you see those numbers here on, on where some of the areas that you might focus on. Uh, um, I obviously realize that Ohio's you know, vast, and so some of your areas are more urban, uh, some of your areas are more rural. And so, uh, but these were the, at least on the statewide level, what, uh, what the data showed. So um, something to use uh, as you develop your own plan. So now we'll move in and talk a little bit about developing local road safety plans, get into the, the steps. Um, I mentioned that the local road safety plans are one of the proven safety countermeasures. We'll talk, talk more about the proven safety countermeasures as we go. Uh, but this uh, are the six steps that are included in that process. Uh, we've even fine-tuned this even more as we've been doing more with local road safety plans, and we've actually come down to more four steps uh, uh, that I think help simplify that process. And so uh, this is an infographic that we recently produced, um, and I'll walk you through it. We actually have a, a video that just got released on this. Uh, actually, if you're on Facebook or Twitter on the FHWA site, you would have saw this pushed out on Monday. So this is brand new. Um, and so I'll just talk you through it, and then uh, if you have a chance, please watch the video on your own. 
Um, the first step is you start up in the upper right hand, uh, right hand corner is to identify the stakeholders. And so um, certainly getting out of the out of the silos and, and reaching out to others. So um, including folks in your own office, especially if you have maintenance folks, but then uh, getting law enforcement. Uh, working with your, your public health folks, your EMS folks, and your elected officials. And um, we'll talk more about that, but uh, there's a reason we put a, a cafe on there. And so um, then you move on from that, you start using your safety data and, and how that can be helpful. Um, you don't have to have great data. We'll talk about some of the varying levels of data that can be used. In Ohio, you're blessed with very, very good data, and the DOT is, uh, is always willing to help you out in, in, in analyzing that. So uh, not much of an issue for you guys. Uh, then we select proven solutions to those situations uh, and implement those solutions. So um, hopefully you have a chance to watch that video. I think they did an excellent job of keeping it very simple, uh, and, and, but uh, very informative. So, um, so I'll skip over that. That's uh, available there on YouTube. Um, we'll move on to the steps. Uh, uh, again, first step, identifying those stakeholders. Uh, you didn't see on the sign, it didn't talk about cities, townships, MPOs, or LTAPs, uh, or even DOTs, because we, we, we assume that you already uh, had them at the table, that the transportation agencies already work with all those folks. Uh, but we talk about getting out of, the, out of the silos and talking with law enforcement, public health, EMS, uh, elected officials, schools. Um, if you've got an Amish community, you might want to include the Amish community in that. If you've got tribes, certainly reach out to the tribes. So uh, you see in the top picture there, a uh, cup of coffee. And to me, uh, if you want to talk about the most cost-effective thing you can do, it's buying a cup of coffee. Sit down with those other those other folks. Uh, you know, meet with your law enforcement folks. Uh, it could be over breakfast before you even have a kickoff meeting. Just sit down with them and talk about what your issues are, what do they see as the big issues, and uh, and then you can start uh, you know you know de developing that relationship and then moving on and talking about data as you go. So. Uh, that can be useful. Uh, here we talk about using safety data and risks. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, databases that are out there, um, and, and it's really easy to get overwhelmed with all the databases, quite frankly, as well. And so um, uh, the, the beauty in this is that for local road safety plans, things don't have to be that complicated. We can talk about the, the process and what we call the systemic process, uh, and we'll touch on more of that in, uh, in, in detail here in just a bit. So uh, no data, no problem. There's a lot of anecdotal information. There's data from existing sources, uh, you know, maintenance logs, things like that. Um, you know, your own maintenance folks can be a very big resource to you. They're the ones that are out there that, that see edge drop-offs or uh, you know, they're putting the sign back up for the third time. They can alert you to those situations. Uh, again, with law enforcement, you know, they're probably the closest thing that we have in the field to a behaviors expert, a human human factors expert, because they observe drivers making mistakes and doing the wrong things uh, when they're driving down the road. So uh, they can be a wealth of uh, information for you. So. Um, just some other sources. Obviously, we have the, the crash uh, data. Uh, again, the Ohio DOT has got great data there. Uh, maintenance requests. Even your SHSP can be a start uh, if you don't have anything. So, um, again, we these these problems aren't unique. We see the same things around the country. You know, risks such as you know horizontal curves, unpaved roads, uh, intersections. Again, I mentioned the signs. You know, if the sign's been knocked down three times, there's probably something going on there. So. Uh, we can spend a little bit of time uh, delving into those details. So uh, when you look at your crash data, we, we sort of look at different things. Uh, we start with just the primary crash details. You know, what kind of type, what, what, what type of crash was it? Uh, was it an intersection or not an intersection? Was there a fixed object struck? Uh, we look at some of the roadway conditions. What was the conditions at the time of the crash? You know, what were the weather was, was like? Um, roadway surface condition, light conditions, those kind of things. Uh, getting into the details of the road, is, is it, is it a horizontal curve? Is it a transit section? You know, what's the posted speed? Um, certainly the driver details, the contributing circumstances of any of our road users, driver, pedestrian, or cyclist, can tell us a lot about what was going on there. Um, one of the things that we've been using, uh, and this actually comes from Washington State, uh, we'll talk more about that as we go, but uh, this is a crash data summary. We've actually been putting this data into Excel spreadsheets and providing it's kind of a, a generalized information form here. So um, just to show you a little bit, uh, see if you can see my cursor there. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Um, on the right-hand side, we've kind of got... see it to uh, the right. You can see it now? Yeah, we could to the right there. But go ahead, sorry. How about now? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. 
So on the right hand side of the screen, we have total crashes, and this happens to be County X. We've uh, we've genericized it so that you wouldn't know uh, who what agency this is. Uh, uh, and then on the left hand side in the red, we've got just the the severe crashes or the fatal and serious injury crashes. And so here you see um, their crashes by year. Um, to the left of these boxes for this county, you see what they called West Counties. This was in uh, Washington State, as I mentioned. So they wanted to look at, you know, what's happening with my peer counties uh, and how do I relate to them? Uh, then they looked at all counties and then even all public roads. And so you see here some things that are highlighted. Um, on all roads, the, you know, fixed objects being struck is about 28% of the severe crashes that are occurring. Uh, for the counties, that jumps up to 43%, but in this particular county, it was 54% of the issue. And so any of those things that were overrepresented from total crashes to severe crashes, we went through and highlighted those. And um, this is just one page. This actually goes down probably four or five pages of different um, efforts that we're looking at. The you know, collision type is just one, road surface. Uh, we get into driver contributing factors and circumstances and whatnot as well. So uh, just to give you an idea how that works. But um, you did... Uh, one of the things you can do to help focus where you're going is, is determine those emphasis areas. You know, is it roadway departure? Is it intersections, pedestrians? Uh, is it impaired driving? You know, things like seatbelt usage, those kind of things. And so that can really help focus your efforts. You don't have to analyze every crash or every ro every mile of your roadway system. You just look at those that uh, that are having those issues. And so uh, these happen to be the emphasis areas from Ohio uh, SHSP. Um, you see the serious crash types, the roadway roadway departure and intersections. Um, also get into some of those high-risk behaviors. So like I mentioned seatbelts, impaired driving, speed, uh, young drivers, distraction, of course, is something that we see uh, growing uh, every day. Uh, and then also your vulnerable users or your special users. So, um, And then data, that's good to see as well. So uh, this just happens to be one uh, agency. They, they broke it down by, uh, by roadway type, by county paved uh, system, county unpaved system, and even the cities to see where those issues were occurring. Um, so they might not have to take on this whole... Um, you know, 823 crashes, they're going to focus on those areas that have uh, the biggest bang for the buck. So uh, on the city, uh, they really could focus on just the intersection issues, uh, you know, for the low-hanging fruit. Uh, for the county pay system, it was the non-curved section. So uh, that's where they saw the biggest needs. So um, this is just another example of, of taking those um, those data summary tables and turning them into what we call crash tree diagrams. So uh, I'll kind of walk you through this. This might be the first time you've seen this. Uh, this comes from Minnesota uh, in, in their efforts for local road safety plans. So they're looking here at, uh, at one uh, district area or region, uh, and then they broke it down by uh, severe crashes on the state system, uh, on the county road system, and then also cities and townships. And so uh, focusing on the counties, uh, they broke it down by rural and urban. I'll just walk you through one example here. So uh, looking at, at the rural area of the counties, that was uh, the biggest portion of the problem, 77% of all crashes and 89% of the severe crashes. Uh, most of those were non-animal related, so uh, and most of those were not intersections. So 64% uh, of these crashes were not intersections. So um, breaking it down into the type of crash, uh, predominantly run off the road was an issue, uh, and 63% of those severe crashes, and then 61 of those run off road crashes were on curves. And so um, they could easily jump uh, for the first cut uh, of where to focus their efforts uh, to uh, curves. Let's look at curves and see what, we, what kind of improvements we can do there. So um, as I mentioned, we, through our pilot, we did this for some other counties. This happens to be a county in Colorado. Uh, and you, if you see the yellow highlighted boxes, those are the ones that were overrepresented um, in comparison to, uh, to the, the total crashes in other counties. And so um, here you see some intersection issues. Um, they looked at uh, broadside being a problem, and so these were non-signalized intersections, and so there was a lot of issues going on there. Um, here's one that's delving into the horizontal curve issue uh, on those that ran off the road to the right and, and to the left, uh, and of course we saw a lot of overturning uh, crashes. Um, we've also, uh, I guess, uh, found out there's some data, data issues in some of the recording of some of these crashes on the local system in Colorado, so that's some things that they're already working on as well. So. Um, this can help you really kind of figure out what's going on, and I'll show some examples of that as we go here, too. So this has to be a, a, an example from Plymouth County, Iowa, um, up in the northwest part of Iowa. Again, my home state, I actually work out of Ames, and so um, this shows you their crashes in 2013. They averaged uh, about 54 crashes, so about one per month um, over a five-year period. So here you see 2013 crashes. Um, in 2014, that sort of exploded. We had a lot going on in the center part of the state, a couple in the southeastern part of that county. 
Um, in 2015, those dots moved. They, they migrated upwards and even to the to the left, uh, to the lower left. And in 2016, they were all you know concentrated in the southern part of the county. And in 2017, they migrated to the north. And so this shows you a map of all those crashes. And so if you just look at severe crashes, and, and if you looked at even just the fatal crashes, this you'd even see this uh, more pronounced as, as moving around uh, the county. Uh, but the, the, the fact of the matter is these, these severe crashes are fairly random in nature. And so uh, the particular location that these happen are random, uh, but the circumstances typically are not. And so um, a lot of these things, a lot of these severe crashes here have a lot of factors in common. And so we can take this data set and, and start to tease out what, what were the things that were common in all these severe crashes? What was the, 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 the lane width of these roads? What was the shoulder uh, width of these roads? What, uh, what does the roadside look like in these situations? Um, you know, was alcohol involved in these crashes? So, and we can start figuring out what the commonalities are from these crashes, and we can start to figure out uh, where does this happen on our system? Where, does, where are these things present on our system? Because um, it's probably, you know, the next dot that's going to show up in 2018 probably isn't at any of these locations, right? You don't see, if you, if you watch these dots, and I'll, I'll back up maybe just a little bit, uh, but if you pick out one dot in 2013, say, um, that dot doesn't get repeated as you, you know, these things keep moving around. And so uh, we don't want to just focus on the dots. We want to focus at, uh, on the locations that uh, the characteristics are the same as these dots. And so that can help us really make uh, uh, a lot more progress and a lot more data-driven decisions that will help us in the future. So um, rather than just try to ch chase black spots. Uh, so we'll take a step back and, and, and maybe talk just from a doctor's standpoint. Uh, you know, the systemic approach that we're going to talk about you know, really comes from the medical field. And so if you think about it, uh, if you've had a physical uh, recently or you, you went in because you had some, some issues, you know, before you even see anyone, you, you fill out a form that, that asks you a whole bunch of questions, right? It's going to want to know um, kind of your, your health history, right? It's going to ask you questions about um, how often do you exercise? Uh, are you a smoker? Um, how many drinks do you consume in a week? Um, what's your family history? You know, is there is there a history of health disease, uh, heart disease? Is there, um, you know, what have what have your relatives uh, faced? Has anyone died early? Those kind of things. Then you then you go back and the first thing they do they're gonna they're gonna take your weight, they're gonna take your height, they're gonna uh, you know check your blood pressure and whatnot. Um, before they've even asked you a question, right? Before the before the doctors even come in, and so, um, and then they're going to ask you what kind of symptoms are, you know, what are issues are you experiencing? How have you been feeling? Those kind of things. And so, what they're doing is kind of walking through that to see what you might be at risk for. So, um, you know, if if you're 500 pounds and and you find out that uh, that there's a history that you know your your father and your mother both died of heart disease. Uh, that your grandfather had a heart attack, they're going to say, hey, you're prone or at, at higher risk to have a heart issue or have, uh, you know, heart disease. And so they're going to come up with some things to try and counteract that, right? So we can do the same thing with our roadway system. And so as I just talked about, you know, let's look at what happens at these severe crashes and what can we glean from those situations? You know, what, what are the characteristics that are common at all these locations that can help us um, uh, preventatively go out and look for where these situations are uh, are going to occur, just like you do with your health. Uh, we want to find these things out before you have a heart attack, right? So um, very similar to that. So uh, looking at it from a systemic approach, uh, we look for those roadway characteristics across our network that are correlated with those severe crash, those crash types. So here you see sort of a sieve analysis, and we're looking at different uh, features. And, and this, this process can be really, uh, you know, tailored to the, the data that you have available. And so uh, here we, we talk about roadway features such as shoulder type, horizontal curves, um, access, uh, intersection skew, things like that. Uh, traffic volume can be a, a big uh, feature, and we'll show that uh, in one of our examples today. Um, other features, you know, uh, operating speed, uh, proximity to rail crossings, those kind of things can be very helpful. So these all come from the Systemic Safety Project Selection Tool. There again, you see a link to that tool. If you haven't checked that out, that's a really great resource to walk you through this process. And so we also put together a, a, a systemic uh, infographic as well, talking about how healthy is your road system. And so, um, you know, applying that doctor mentality, that medical field uh, process, 
to our road system. And see here, we had pulled out risk factors such as uh, uh, traffic volume, curve radius, uh, intersections occurring within those curves, visual traps, and we'll talk more about that as we go if you're not familiar with those are, uh, and then having those crashes that have occurred. So that can help us really hone in on our system uh, so that we're not trying to treat, you know, 300 curves or 3,000 curves. We're trying to go after 30 curves, right? So uh, we can figure out those ones that are most uh, at risk. So you know, here's just some general uh, risk factors that, that you might look at. Uh, there's a whole list of these in that uh, in that in that guidebook. So, and then once we have those risk factors and we figure out which ones we're going to use, we analyze our system or, or screen our network to see where these uh, these situations occur on our network. Uh, and so we rank those uh, those 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 sections or quarters. Um, and, and then we, we, of course, uh, put the ones with the most stars at the top. And so we'll show an example of what this looks like as we go. So, um, and this can be somewhat qualitative. You know, we, we talked about curve radius and those things. We don't necessarily need to know the radius of curve. But we can know, is, is it a sharp curve? Is it a medium curve? Or is it a flat curve? Uh, is the roadside good, bad, or ugly, right? So um, the qualitative can certainly tell us enough uh, about what we need to know. So, uh, then we move on to the step uh, step three. Uh, we'll have uh, to choose our proven solutions. Look at uh, you know focusing on that that facility priority or crash type priority that we that we've already identified, and then we look at proven countermeasures to address those things. So um, hopefully all of you are familiar with um, uh, FHWA's proven safety countermeasures. We're now up to 20. There were six that were just added uh, this last year, and so um, some of those certainly are applicable to uh, to county roads, uh, particularly the intersection one and systemic application of low cost treatments. Um, even the pedestrian uh, lead intervals might be something you guys are interested in. So just showing a, a few of these. Uh, there's a flyer, a two page flyer front and back. Uh, on all these countermeasures. This one uh, happens to be on enhanced delineation and friction for horizontal curves. Um, you see there some of the, the, the down and dirty facts of chevrons can reduce nighttime crashes by 25%. Uh, it can have a reduction in 16% of the, the severe crashes. Uh, high friction surface treatments uh, certainly are very effective on wet weather crashes. So if that's an issue, um, it's certainly a great countermeasure that can help you with that. Uh, I mentioned the new one, the systemic application of multiple low cost countermeasures. Um, this is something that you can do and, and probably something that folks weren't uh, familiar with. They thought, well, the METCD just talks about a stop ahead and a stop sign. Um, you can always double up. You can make those signs more conspicuous. You can um, put in two advanced warning signs. You can add um, you know, reflective stripe uh, strips to the post to make those even more visible. So uh, those have shown a reduction in 10% in, in, uh, in injury and fatal crashes and 15% reduction in nighttime crashes. So a lot of this was done in South Carolina uh, and all their intersections. They had a, a huge intersection issue uh, that they addressed. So uh, rumble strips is another one, again, very effective. Um, and, and here see centerline rumble strips, 44 to 64 percent of those those targeted type crashes. Now the beauty is we don't have to put centerline rumble strips on the entire system. We just need to to put rumble strips on the the at risk system, and we'll talk more about that as we go uh, as well. So um, a leading pedestrian intervals. This is another one that's going to be added. In fact, will be promoted under step. If you saw today, they just put out the EDC five everyday counts five round of initiatives that uh, includes. Uh, the continu continuation of step and adding a few countermeasures such as a leading pedestrian interval at signalized intersections. So um, this can help reduce uh, your pedestrian vehicle crashes by 60%. So something you guys might look at uh, with all the pedestrian crashes you've had there on the local system. So um, there's also uh, something for law enforcement and behavioral side of things uh, on what they call NHTSA's countermeasures that work. Uh, there's nine sections in that guide. I'm just pulling out a few of those. Uh, sobriety checkpoints, or uh, in Iowa, we call these safety checkpoints, can be something that's very effective. Uh, it's a great way for law enforcement agencies from different uh, agencies to work together. You know, county sheriff working with uh, city police department and state patrol and motor vehicle enforcement folks um, uh, to, to work events together. And, and those can be very helpful. Uh, to reduce those those alcohol related ca crashes uh, for sure in Iowa the the governor's highway safety office actually built some trailers uh, that uh, any county sheriff's office or any local agency can check out it's got all the cones in there in the trailer it's uh, it's got the proper signing to do the checkpoints to get folks off the, the road safely um, it, it even includes things like fans and lighting and coolers because because it can be hot when they're doing these things so it's uh, all in one box so to speak uh, for them to do these events and 
um, can really be uh, you know visible. So um, high visible enforcement, you know, a lot of agencies can do that. Uh, those show really um, benefit of the, you know, uh, reductions, particularly if they're done with media. And so a lot of times in local agencies, if you've got a small town newspaper, you know, they're starving for real news and they're happy to run those those uh, those articles about uh, you know what you're doing, what you're out there for. Um, that can be helpful to those folks too. So. Uh, nighttime enforcement, of course, that's when a lot of the bad things happen, and so uh, that can also be an effective treatment. So uh, we talk about uh, step four being implementing the solutions. Um, so this is a, a quote that my uh, colleague, Hillary Eisenbrins, who works in the Resource Center office, uh, uses all the time from Theodore Roosevelt. It says, do what you can with what you have where you are. And so um, you, know, you can start small, you can start tomorrow with uh, things that can be done. Um, once you start looking at your data sets. So and I do want to make one, uh, I guess, distinction. I talk about systematic. That's really deploying a countermeasure at all locations. Systemic is deploying those countermeasures at locations with the greatest potential for safety improvement, just like I was talking about with those centerline rumble strips. We don't have to do the whole system. Let's just figure out where they might have the most benefit. And, and, and it's data-driven. Um, are you going to get noise complaints? Probably so, but if it's data driven, that makes it a little bit easier for folks to accept and understand. It's something if you include it in your plan, you can also help sell folks on the need for that. So they, they, they've got that information behind the scenes to explain why you're doing it there. So, um, and as I said, do what you can where you're at, right? So um, you can start with things. You don't have to wait to do a capital improvement project to get started with your plan. You can start implementing that with education and enforcement. Um, certainly maintenance projects, you know, getting out signs. Let's not wait till someone hits the tree at the end of this curve, right? Let's get these extra signs out there. Um, and then also look at some capital projects too. There's, there's certainly things that, that can help, but you know, if you're going to apply for HSIP funds, you got to wait till the state makes the funds available. Then the feds have to actually put the funds in the system. Uh, then you've got to go out and, and, and get it designed. Maybe you're going to put that out to a consultant, so you have to put the RFP out there. You have to select a consultant. You design it. Then you've got to you know get. Then you've got to put it out uh, for bid. Uh, and you got to give the contractors time to bid on it, and then also do the construction. So you know, three years can go real fast, right, on on a real project. And so there's a lot you can do before that happens. So. Uh, working with law enforcement, again, that's some great things. Uh, maybe you have a roadway that needs some improvements, but uh, before you can get out there, ha have law enforcement start doing some targeted enforcement on that, too. So um, it also helps them, too. You know, we've talked to law enforcement. Sometimes they'll say, hey, if I'm going to write a seatbelt ticket, I just lost one vote in the next election, right? So um, that can be a challenging issue. But the one thing that can help them, too, is this data. And um, you know, as they stop the person, they, you know, they explain that, hey, I'm not just trying to be a bad guy here. Uh, this road has been, in, in our county, this is the, the highest, uh, uh, you know, number of severe crashes for unbelted uh, persons. And so, um, again, that makes it a little bit easier to swallow. They certainly aren't going to like the fine, but uh, but maybe that makes them think about it and say, gee, you really educated me on, on, not, uh, on not doing that anymore and wearing their seatbelt. So, um, as you go through that process, you want to come up with a priorities list of roadway sections. This is just one example of what that looks like. We talked about star ratings a little bit. You probably want a, a manageable number of, of five-star locations, right? You don't want a whole bunch of those. Um, Four-star locations, that uh, you have a few more of those, a few more three-star locations, and then uh, down the road, two stars, one stars, and zero stars. So if you come up with uh, five stars and you still have 50 locations, then you probably need to add a couple of roadway factors to make that better yet. So. Um, this I won't spend a lot of time on. These, these decision trees can also help you as you look at policies. You know, if you're looking at rumble strips or rumble stripes, you can go through the process. Is noise a concern? You know, what do we have for lane width and whatnot? So, and then of course, step five: evaluate and update the plan. We see these as living documents and things that you can um, evolve and, and update over time. As you start to uh, have some successes, hopefully you document that and then build on those successes with the next round of projects. So. These plans come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, we have plans that are, you know, anywhere from probably three pages to 300 pages, uh, maybe even more than that. If you bring in a consultant, you'll see some of these are, are prettier than others. Um, certainly, consultants have a role in these. Uh, we've talked to agencies that have paid, I think, from anywhere from 40,000 to some that came back to 
150 to even one that was 250,000 was the quote for uh, for developing their plan. Now that had some data collection things in it too, but uh, uh, but a plan doesn't have to be uh, fancy or sexy. It just needs to to be functional for you, and so you can certainly start small and go from there. Uh, I'll mention the one on the right is from uh, one of our tribal uh, agencies. We have over 300 tribes in the United States that have uh, tribal safety plans now. So they've been really uh, uh, taking this to heart and, and really finding some solutions. So, um, Jerry, this is Victoria. I'm going to jump in here real quick just to follow sure. up with your comment about the, the other plans. Um, one of the reasons, too, for asking you to do the webinar today is that Ohio is moving forward with um, an initiative for development of local road safety plans on the local system. And there's going to be um, assistance coming from the, the safety office. So more information is going to come out about that over the next few months. And, you know, the folks here in Ohio, we definitely encourage them to start looking and thinking local road safety plans, but know that the assistance is going to be um, coming as well. So, you know, we're here to definitely support them through that process. Um, and Jordan Whistler, who has joined the, the safety office here in Ohio, is going to be helping to lead that charge. So didn't want to detract too much, though, because I know you still have quite a bit to go. No, that's excellent, Victoria. And you guys, you're you're very fortunate to be in Ohio because you have a wealth of resources that are assisting. So that's excellent. So um, go ahead and move on here. Um, we'll go through this, and this is just some examples from Washington State. I'll go through this fairly quickly. But uh, in Washington State, again, um, they found that the, their counties maintain 47% of the roadway mileage, but the fatal crash rate is twice as high as their state highways. And so. Uh, in Washington, they do a great job of sharing their safety funds. They put the funds, their HSIP funds, uh, where the issues are. So 70% of that funding goes to the local agencies uh, and then is further split 40% to cities and 30% to counties based on where they see the severe crashes occurring. So um, they put together a, a lot of money. Uh, when they started doing that, when they started making those funds available, they wanted to make those counties have a county road safety plan. So they required those plans to exist uh, for them to apply for funds. And so they went through a process. They did a lot of training. Uh, I won't get into a lot of that detail, but they helped provide those crash summary details. Uh, and then the agencies actually developed these plans all by themselves. These were all developed by the counties, not by consultants or anything else. So 80% um, of the counties have plans now and, and use those plans to apply for funding. So um, this, they took about 80 hours. I won't get into a lot of the details, but uh, they're actually just starting to uh, require plans for cities now as well. So. Um, th those first round will be uh, due yet this summer. So, uh, and I'll show one example. This is Thurston County, Washington. So, um, up in the the Olympia area, if you're familiar with Washington, um, you know, very large county, um, a lot of traffic volume. They have a thousand miles of roadways out there. Uh, it's probably not very different from some uh, Ohio counties. Um, 131 severe crashes over a, a five-year period. Um, and 56% of those were, were roadway departures. So sort of similar to what I showed you earlier, here's their um, uh, fatal crashes. You see how these will move around here. Again, none of these happening in the same spot. So um, they went through the crash data, as I mentioned, that uh, this was done by um, Washington for them. Uh, um, and then they, when, they, when they started honing in on their data, um, they see horizontal curves uh, stand up. So if you guys are familiar with Thurston County and, and Scott Davis, he's a leader uh, within uh, NACE and, and, and as a safety champion. Uh, he knew roadway departure was happening uh, on their severe crashes. He had no idea that horizontal curves were so overrepresented in their state. And so you see there all roads 26%, all counties 39%, Thurston County 45%. So they really went a whole hog and, and focused on counties. Um, I'll talk about this fairly quickly. They had 5,000 total crashes. If you looked at all their crashes, again, 1,000 centerline miles. When they looked at curves, that reduced those number of crashes down to 1,500. And you see here, those basically were all on-system crashes. So they could, instead of looking at 1,000 miles of roadway, they could look at 300 miles, a third of their system, uh, and, and see where those crashes, those severe crashes were happening. So that system was certainly overrepresented. 350 miles is still a lot, but it's a lot less than 1,000. So. 
Then they started looking at risk factors. They went through that systemic uh, selection tool, picked out a, a number of uh, risk factors to see if those made sense, and, and some did, some they ended up throwing out. Uh, they did do some data collection. They used the data that they have available in their systems. Um, their field data collection was not roadware videos or anything like that. They just sent two guys in a van out to, to drive around and capture a, a little bit more information on some things. So they used analysis. They used those pivot tables. Some of these bar graphs I'll show you. Um, again, this looked at their on-system roads. They broke that down even further and found out that the system that was really overrepresented was the rural major collectors. Uh, and so that got them down to, to 209 miles to look at um, where those crashes were represented. Um, they didn't include rural minor collectors. You see there, 15% of the system is rural minor collectors, but it's only 9% of the serious injury crashes. So um, they, they, they tried to use the data to help guide that. So uh, they focused in on certain traffic volumes. It was uh, 3,000 to 8,000 uh, vehicle miles uh, per day. Um, that's where they focused on. So uh, again, overrepresented. So they looked at roadside rating. This is one of the things that they were able to capture when they sent people out. But uh, um, you see good, bad, and ugly sort of things here. But um, uh, looking at clearance, and again, edge clearance three, This the, the bottom picture where those trees are right off the side of the road. Um, you know, is well overrepresented. So it's only 19% of the locations, but 36% uh, of the severe crashes. So they looked at proximity of intersections to curves or within curves. Uh, visual trap, that's where the road looks like it goes straight. You know, you get some visual cues like, uh, um, you know, telephone poles here that make it look like the roadway goes straight, but it actually curves. And so that was overrepresented as well. Um, they scored those with points. And so if it had traffic volume, if it had intersection in the curve, um, it was um, a rural major collector. If it had shoulders, um, edge clearance um, that we talked about, um, it received one point. Other things like winding roads, uh, visual traps, they had less, a little less confidence or they weren't sure these were as big a deal. The, the speed differential from the posted speed versus the advisory speed um, got half a point. And so they went through their system. The highest ranked location you see here is Hawks Prairie Road. That scored a six. And so uh, there's about, uh, I think there was 270 different curves they looked at. So this, this table went down, but you see the top three there. Um, so no one had nine, even though they used nine factors. Six was the highest. And so this is kind of how it played out. As I mentioned, that pyramid, they had uh, eight that scored in the five to six range, 21 that went four to five, and 65 in that uh, three to four range. So pretty good bell curve here, if, uh, if you're familiar with that from a statistics standpoint. So they looked at those countermeasures that made the most sense, uh, that were proven, uh, widespread use from other agencies. Um, they put together kind of a matrix to look at costs and, and you know, how long it was going to take for permitting and right away and those kind of things, how much maintenance was going to be required of it. Uh, what is the crash modification factor? How, how effective is this going to be? And they use that to help figure out what their solutions were. Um, they came up with basically the proven countermeasures, right? There's a lot on curves and, and enhanced edge lines. Um, uh, guardrail delineation. In some cases, they updated the guardrail and, and put in some new guardrail. Uh, and they used rumble strips, shoulder, center line, and even edge line, as well as raised pavement markers where they couldn't do rumble strips due to noise. And so they went whole hog. They spent about $4 million uh, of HSIP funds. Uh, they kept applying and kept receiving funds. So uh, they put a lot of improvements in. And I've seen a huge reduction. Their reduction uh, in, in, in severe crashes at curves is a 35% reduction. Now, this actually looks at all curves in the county. It's not, it's not just the ones that were treated. So if you looked at just the treated locations on the on-system roadway, uh, it, it'd even be more effective in showing you that those, those uh, improvements were uh, you know, very effective. So um, they found this to be very helpful. So as I said, they did this all by their own staff. They ranked 270 curves, used those countermeasures, and reduced those crashes on their entire network by 35% and curves. So, but folks, if they've got questions, uh, I'll just finish up with a few more slides here, and they can start thinking about their questions if they've got questions on any of that. Uh, I mentioned all, all the different shapes and sizes. We do have some resources out there. Uh, we did come up with a local road safety plan template. Again, this just kind of walks you through. This is like a, a three or four page template that helps you figure out what your vision and goals. Here's what the data tells you. And you can really just uh, sort of plug in your agency's name here and start using this. So um, some agencies certainly have used that. Um, I mentioned tribal transportation plans. We've got uh, several examples that we've shared there. Um, several from Washington State, even North Dakota has got a page that you can look up the, their web page. Those were developed by consultants, and so um, they're a little thicker, but uh, have some good information in them too. So, um, some of the resources I mentioned our video that that uh, is available, uh, as well as the infographic. Um, 
and then the, the systemic infographic as well. So, um, and with that, my biggest things are uh, execute. You know, and, and this, I'll just say this is a dead French guy uh, in, in shortness of time here, but a goal without a plan is just a wish. And my favorite quote uh, comes from General George Patton, a good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan next week. So, you know, every time I hear you say that, it grows on me. <laughs> yeah, I think the violently executed part is certainly important. You know, what can we do now instead of waiting three years? I'm, I think I suffer from ADHD myself, and so I always want to get going on those things. Um, plans can be very helpful, but um, you know, I'd rather you come up with a, a plan that you can develop on your own in six months and and save the fifty thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to uh, you know start doing things right, start putting in. Uh, improve signing and markings, those kind of things. So well, and the that's key my is personal preference. Data. I mean, and we have lots of data here in Ohio, so you know we're fortunate in that sense. Um, I haven't had any actual questions come in through the chat pod, so I just wanted to give it another second or two for anyone who wanted to type one in to feel free to, and to thank you, Jerry, so much for this presentation. We feel like we were drinking from the fire hydrant, but we've got it all now. So hopefully we'll be able to, you know, use this base information to move into the Ohio specific program that's being developed. Um, I am going to look at unmuting the phone line. So if anybody's got a party going on in the background, um, please feel free to, you know, go ahead and quiet those folks down real quick. And Jerry, did you want to mention about this slide? Uh, just that uh, if you have any information or you, you want more information, feel free to reach out. Uh, there's a number of things on our website, but uh, certainly go through Victoria as well. So um, I, we did cover a lot of materials. So if you have questions um, today, I'm happy to take them now. And if, uh, if you think of things over time, uh, feel free to reach out. We've got a whole team of folks that are, are really pushing these uh, local road safety plans. We see these as the next big thing and, and certainly something that can be very effective for your agency. So. Uh, and I welcome anyone if, uh, if they've got thoughts. I know um, Cornell's happen, helping us out in Franklin County with some other things uh, going forward on, on the data-driven approach. I know he's been a big proponent of what this has done, too. So. Sounds good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and unmute now. So if anyone has questions, they can feel free to, to ask them over the audio. You'll just need to click on your little um, microphone there on the, the screen and unmute yourself as well, but we're happy to, to take your questions either through the audio or through the chat pod. And this is the part where they all get really quiet because they don't want to be on the recording, I'm afraid, Jerry. I understand how that goes. <laughs> so we will follow up after this webinar. Um, again, with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation with the contact information and the links to the videos. I'm sorry that we couldn't get those to work for you. Um, but, you know, we did try a dry run ahead of time, and today it just didn't want to cooperate. So I guess we don't have any questions. Going once, twice. You did a great job, Jerry. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it, and thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Glad to do it, Victoria. Thank you very much. All right. Everyone have a good day.